Good morning and welcome to the bi-weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. I'm Alan Sherman, Professor of Computer Science at UMBC and Director of the CDL. Uh, today we kick off the spring series uh, with a talk by PhD student Christian Babalato, who, who led the recent January SFS Scholar Research Study. In, in which, um, as we do each year, uh, students work collaboratively to analyze uh, an aspect of the security of the UMBC network. Uh, this year's uh, task was to look at a method by which uh, the Department of uh, DOIT anonymized network traffic for researchers, um, and they had considerable success as they've had each year. We have a great lineup for the spring. In two weeks, um, Mario Yatsetsig is going to present some very interesting work on uh, making uh, captures more secure. So, um, without further ado, um, uh, Christian, we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right, can everyone see the slides okay? Good. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Sherman said, my name is Christian Badalato. I am a PhD student here at UMBC. I work under uh, Dr. Roberto Yus, and my focus is uh, data privacy, IoT, and um, things of that nature. So, um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, winter 2024 study. And um, really, I'm here to say that anonymized data can still tell tales. So before I get started, um, let me briefly go over what I want to talk about. So I assume a lot of you here probably are familiar, but I'm going to give a brief introduction to like the SFS study, what it is, if you're not familiar with the acronym, what that is. Um, and then I'm going to briefly introduce the study topic and the actual goal of um, the study and what we did. And then I'm going to take a step back just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. I want to give a very quick primer on what we mean by anonymization. You're probably familiar with the term anonymization, anonymize, things like that. But in data privacy, it's a very specific term that actually um, corresponds to particular techniques we use. So I want to make sure that we're on the same page as far as what that means. Uh, then I want to return to the actual study, talk about the methods of attack we use to actually go about um, evaluating and um, attacking the anonymization protocols used by uh, the Division of Information Technology. I'll go over the results of what we learned from that and then recommendations uh, we provided to do it as far as how they could improve the protocol, improve how they were doing this to increase privacy in the future. Um, just a upfront note, um, the specific technical hey, details buddy. and things like specific architecture and operations of how the system works hey, are protected. Um, so I'm not going to be discussing specific technical hey. details, but I can still give enough information that should give you a very solid view of how we went about um, doing what we did. So as far as what the general SFS study purposes. So, as uh, Dr. Sherman was saying, during the winter term, the UMBC Scholarship for Service SFS cohort uh, participates in a research study. It's a study that typically deals with analyzing and potentially attacking aspects of DOIT systems uh, to check their security, to um, help them strengthen the systems that they have. The ultimate goal of these studies is to provide recommendations for improving the security of the system. Uh, we're not doing anything maliciously. We're always trying to help them improve their systems. This is really great because the students who are involved with this get practical experience of cybersecurity. Uh, it's very common in these programs to only do um, lab-based work or school work in very controlled environments and getting hands-on experience with a real system that's actually fielded and in active use is really great for these students. So that's a really cool thing. Um, but also, as Dr. Sherman was saying, this year's focus was not actually fully on cybersecurity. It was more on data privacy. 
which are is a related but slightly different concept. And so since it was on privacy, uh, my advisor, Dr. Roberto, Roberto Use, was invited to be a co-organizer, and I was invited to be uh, the student leader for this particular project. So I was very happy to um, help lead the students in this particular study. So the sort of 10,000 foot view of what we were doing is that DOIT wants to assist research on campus uh, by providing data on campus network traffic to the researchers at UMBC so they can perform various research opportunities. However, as you can imagine, since network traffic contains a lot of personal information, uh, they do apply privacy protection techniques to the data set, and the students of this study were tasked with evaluating those privacy protection strategies and seeing how it could be broken, how it could be improved, and what do it should go to do moving forward to ensure optimal privacy protection while still allowing this data to be used. So, how is do it actually capturing this traffic, or what are they capturing? So. As some of you might know, UMBC actually owns a range of public facing IP addresses. This is um, public knowledge. You can actually Google it on the right hand side. I have the net blocks that UMBC has. So that's a public website. You could just Google UMBC um, IP addresses and that would come up. Uh, these addresses are used for things like the GL server, hosting some professor websites, many other services. There's a lot of things on campus uh, that we use these IP addresses for, and not all of them are exposed to the outside internet, but all of them can be if do it particularly wants to. So just because these blocks exist doesn't mean you'll be able to access every IP on them, uh, but they are set aside in case that's needed. So the actual traffic that we're talking about that's being captured is captured at the campus boundary. So this is all incoming traffic to UMBC from external addresses and all outgoing traffic from UMBC to external addresses. So we're not concerned with um, external to external. We're not concerned with UMBC to UMBC. We're only concerned about traffic that's sort of crossing that boundary. So do it sets this up so that way research teams can actually request this data if they have sufficient justification. You can't just go in and say, you want the data, you need to provide like a project, you're looking, you're working on some goals, have a conversation with them about why you need the data. Um, some examples of why we might want this data is, uh, first I have smart campus projects. So if you're thinking that um, it might be good to sort of look at how many people pass through the commons at a particular point in time uh, to avoid the busiest points in time, or the Starbucks line. In order to avoid the busiest points, you may want to look at the network traffic, see how many people are connected to the access points in the university center, and you can sort of then start to build models that will let you uh, track that particular sort of usage. That could be one research project that it would be very helpful to have this network traffic in. Another one is sustainability on campus. Um, for example, HVAC and AC can use a lot of energy and being able to dynamically change uh, how the campus is using its energy based on the uh, current occupancy of rooms is something that might be able to be explored through this sort of network traffic. So there's a lot of good reasons um, we might want this, that it's really great that Do It provides this if uh, we have a suitable reason. However, there is a large risk in network traffic data. First of all, complete raw traffic would be a major concern to just release the whole traffic without anything done to it. Um, it can contain sensitive payloads, it can contain banking information, active research information, emails going back and forth, planning communications between high-ranking members of the university, um, and you can't rely on it to be encrypted. Ideally, we would hope that all of this communication would be encrypted, but you don't want to strictly rely on that being encrypted when you're giving this out. So the payload data is stripped by do it. That would be a massive both security and privacy concern if it was released raw. Um, so that's not what's happening. The payload data is completely stripped off. However, the incomplete traffic is still a concern and the headers of these packets can still contain private information. Um, I provide an example here. So imagine that you uh, take a walk through campus, say Academic Row, every Tuesday at 9 a.m. And there's someone who knows that you do this 
and also knows your smartphone's public IP address. Maybe they're your roommate, maybe they got a hold of something, maybe you plugged in a device that you shouldn't have plugged into your phone and they have your IP address. If they knew you took a walk at Tuesday at 9 a.m., every, every Tuesday at 9 a.m., and they knew your public IP address, they could reasonably search through network traffic header data for your particular traffic, and they might be able to learn the path you take through campus based on which wireless access points your phone connected to. Um, so that's an example of where just having header information and not having the payload information could still be a concern from a privacy standpoint. Thankfully, Doit does understand that there's risks for this, and they do have a strategy to protect privacy as they're releasing this. In specific, they use pseudonymization. And that's used to anonymize the network data. Um, IP address is one such anonymized field, since that's a very identifying piece of data in those packet headers. And this prevents the real IP address of particular campus services and users using the campus network from being known to the people who use the data set, the researchers who gain access to this data. However, there's still the question of could an adept adversary still infer private information or more formally, given both an anonymized data capture and knowledge of how the anonymization process works, could an adversary re-identify which parties were involved with the communications in that data? And so that's what we're kind of looking at is we have the data set, we know what, how the anonymization is performed, what can we do with that knowledge? However, at this point, I do want to take a brief step back and I want to talk about what anonymization actually is from a privacy perspective. I'm assuming that um, as this push to research into privacy is gaining a lot of steam, but it really only started gaining a lot of real, real popularity over the last couple of years. Um, I assume that there might be people here who don't really know what anonymization means from a data science perspective, from a data management perspective. So in data privacy, uh, anonymization is essentially just the process of modifying entries in a data set to reduce the information which can be inferred from that data set. The use case of this is for when People using data when users will need access to a particular data set, but shouldn't actually be able to see all of the raw information present in that data set. An example of this would be protecting data within multiple roles of a company. Uh, it might be important for payroll or financial members of a company to be able to see a user's social security number when they're doing particular operations, but we don't want level one tech support to just be able to pull up someone's social security number at will. So that would be an example where you could use anonymization to separate access between multiple roles of a company. The one we're talking about here is the second one, which is preparing a data set for a public release um, when the data set was kept privately. So we have a lot of things in this data set that was sort of meant to be private, and now we want to release the data set publicly, so we anonymize things in the data set to protect the privacy of the people whose records are in that data set. Um, there are many techniques for this. Uh, there's generalization, suppression, distortion, masking. There's others. These are just popular ones, and some of these go by different names. So if you've heard of other ones, it might be related. There might be some overlap. Uh, it's really just anonymization is just a collection of techniques that we use to accomplish this goal. I do want to note that while generalization is probably one of the more popular ways this is done, especially with like age data, uh, it's not particularly relevant here. So I don't really want to spend time on that particular aspect. But I will talk about the other three briefly. However, when we talk about anonymization, it does beg a particular question. And that question is, why don't we just remove the sensitive data? So the reason we can't just remove the data that may be sensitive is this concept that is very key and crucial in data privacy. It's the concept of privacy versus utility. And we basically mean that as a data set becomes more private, becomes more resistant to inferences, the usefulness of that data set actually decreases over that sort of curve. It's an inverse relationship. Um, for example, there really isn't a reason to have a data set you can't draw conclusions from. Companies, like, they want to 
run algorithms on their data to be able to improve their products. Researchers rely on drawing conclusions from data. A lot of their whole sort of jobs is to draw conclusions from massive data sets for quite a few people. So if we had a perfectly private data set that you couldn't infer anything from it at all, except for what is in the data set, that really isn't a valuable data set. So you have to drive this balance of how much privacy do you want versus how much utility you, do you want? And just removing the sensitive data would give us full privacy and no utility. Um, for a concrete example, take a, take a database of disease infection rates uh, where everyone in it is some person who has been infected by a disease. Um, even if it didn't have names in it, you could consider age and city of residence to be a private attribute that people wouldn't want to get out. Uh, you could theoretically use those things to figure out who a person was. Um, but obviously, when it comes to diseases, we in general expect younger people to be less prone to diseases, or we might expect people in poorer areas to be more prone to having these diseases. So removing those attributes could have a negative impact on whatever model we create based on that data set. So we take the philosophy with anonymization that some data or that some data is better than none. We want to have some utility while still preserving a user's privacy. Um, I do want to say that it is a technique to remove the sensitive data. That is actually what I refer to as suppression in the previous slide. So there are cases in which we can re just remove the sensitive data and that's the best solution. Um, in fact, that's the best option in particular cases such as very sensitive data. I talked about a social security number. Um, so there's a lot of cases in which there is no reason to sort of just provide partial information to a social security number. We just remove the whole thing. We just mask the whole thing. Whoever is accessing this data set doesn't have access to your social security. Um, so that's a common sort of thing is using very sensitive data. We might want to suppress it. Um, another case we might want to suppress data is when you have data with very few possible values it can be. Um, so take uh, the table on the right, the table um, representing gender of the particular users in the database or the people whose records are in the database and say that they can select in this particular application between male, female, and non-binary. Well, there isn't really a way to modify that data without providing information because there's only three options. If we change it to numbers, it'll still be pretty clear after a f some observation what they correspond to. So in that case, just fully suppressing it is typically the most or it's the safest thing to do because otherwise it opens yourself up to inferences. Beyond suppression, uh, we can also do things like distortion, which is adding noise in a recoverable or non-recoverable manner. Um, for example, I on the left side, I just added the row number to the result to sort of distort it. And on the right side, I added Gaussian noise, which you can't go back from. So one, you can sort of go back from, and the other one, once it's applied, it's applied. You might have the original data set, but the modified ones still can't be taken back to the original. However, the one that we're most interested in right now is masking, because this is where that pseudonymization that do it applies to their data comes in. So this is altering the data without actually distorting the values, without changing the statistics of the values. So you could encry just encrypt the values and provide the encrypted output um, in the table, or we can do as do it does and do pseudonymization, where you might see on the table on the right that if I give you ID 10,002, someone with the proper knowledge could map that back and know that is M. Smith, but if I didn't give you that mapping, you would have no way of knowing that 10,002 was M. Smith. And that's sort of what we're looking at here. So with that knowledge of sort of what we mean by anonymization, let's return and look at uh, the study itself and what we were actually doing. So the goal, as I said earlier, is to re-identify the data. That was the what we set out to do when we started the study. Since this is network data, uh, we determined that the uh, best identifier for this data to actually be able to correlate to a um, person or to a notable entity is an IP address. 
Uh, we do also note that the anonymized version must be consistent. And what I mean by that is that in the resulting data set, in the anonymized data set, we would expect the same IP going in to receive the same anonymous IP going out. And the reason for that is, again, for research, if you do not know for sure that flows are going to the same destination, then that data set is very hampered as far as its utility. It's not very useful if we can't tell that particular data is going to the same destination. So you can't just randomize the IP addresses. As far as the vectors of attack we selected, um, first of all, we had access to a white box attack. The students were given the anonymization algorithm source code and the entire workflow, so we knew the whole process. There was no need to have to guess at what it was doing. The second vector that uh, was open to us was the chosen plain text attack, in which students were actually allowed to request specific output from Doit so they could craft packets and attempt to re-identify them in the anonymous output. They could actually send packets and then receive the cipher text, the anonymized data, um, in return to sort of correlate. And so that second one is really what we focused on. Uh, we used the Escapee Python library and created custom packets that were sent into the UMBC network from outside addresses. However, it's not as simple as just sending packets through the network. Um, First of all, for some considerations, only the header data is retained. If you're familiar with how sort of network traffic works under the hood, is these packets that you send are encapsulated with um, headers. So there's headers that get supplied onto the data. And you can have lots of headers. There could be headers and wrapping headers, wrapping headers. But right here, I'm only looking at the IP header, one of the top level headers we look at. So you'll see that in the actual header itself, you have attributes such as version number, packet length, a checksum, um, time to live. So when you're looking at this header data, we also have to consider that we have a need to craft a valid packet. A lot of routers and firewalls will use things like version, packet length, time to live, checksums to determine not only where to send the packet, but whether to drop it on the floor or not. So we can't just go in however we want and throw a packet in because we would expect that to just be dropped on the floor the second it hit the network. The other consideration is that we also need to be able to recognize the packet on the other side. So in addition to having to craft a valid packet for um, or to get through the actual routing to its destination, you also have to make sure when it gets to its destination and gets anonymized, you can recognize it in order to correlate it. So with those considerations in mind, we had our tasks set out for us, and that was to find a field we can modify and mark it with a particular tag that allows us to identify it. Um, the arrow, for example, here points we might use the options field. Again, um, I cannot say what we actually did, what fields we modified or in what way. So um, I'm just giving an example here that is not what we actually did in this study, but it is very equivalent to what we would have done. So, for example, you may have looked at an option in the options field and toggled it to a particular value in such a way that you would expect the packet on the side to retain that same value even when it gets anonymized. So that's sort of what we did is we picked a field, we marked it, and then we sent it off. And that actually brings us to the attack itself. So the attack itself was structured into five parts. So first, the students chose a bunch of different ways to actually go ahead and modify the headers. And the reason for this was we didn't know whether or not anything we were trying would work. Uh, we didn't know which fields were going to be um, sort of checked by the routers or dropped by the firewall. Uh, we did know which fields would be anonymized because we had the source code, so we knew which ones to stay away from using. But beyond that, we really wanted to pick as many different ways to modify the headers as we could think of uh, to ensure that as many tests as possible could get through to its destination. Once um, all the different ways to modify the headers was chosen, uh, the students then sent their packets to different UMBC addresses. And they all sent it during the same time frame to make sure as many packets as possible were actually in the resulting capture that we requested. 
Um, I think in, we did about a 20 minute time frame, which ended up being quite a lot of packets you could send in 20 minutes. Then the anonymized data was requested from um, Do It, so they actually provided us with the data we requested for the specific time frame we requested, and that's what made it the sort of chosen plain text attack, as we could actually request specific ciphertext, specific anonymized data based on what we put in our plain text. Once we received this data, uh, it was then searched for all of the students' tags, whatever they put in, they checked to see if that was in the data that they could um recognize if it was in the anonymized data set in a manner that they could recognize it if they found any packets you could then reasonably reasonably correlate them between the ones you sent and the ones that you not received but were present in the anonymized packet the one that went through the anonymization protocol and that was sort of the structure of the attack design to see if we could actually correlate any packets to learn any sort of information about the network. As far as what we found, it, it was very surprising, full re-identification. Um, many of the tagged packets were actually recovered from the uh, anonymized data set, and each packet was actually able to fully identify uh, one IP address. It was a perfect one-to-one -one correlation, and absolutely no guesswork was required to do this. So, um, in the end, essentially, given enough time of uh, using this attack, you could enumerate the entire anonymized IP list and map every single anonymous IP back to its non-anonymous physical IP, uh, its actual like public IP. So this was quite shocking. We didn't expect to really do this, um, but as the packets came in, we quickly realized that correlating them was much easier than we expected. And as an example of how we correlated them, uh, I have on the bottom here sort of the process we did. Again, uh, this data was created by me. It doesn't reflect the actual data that was in the study. This is ones that I just synthesized for this particular presentation. Um, it doesn't capture the actual fields we used. If you look below, you'll see that I'm actually modifying the data field, which I've already said that do it strips out immediately. Uh, so you couldn't replicate this attack with the same field. But as a general idea, um, essentially we would tag a packet, send a packet out. So in this case, I've tagged the packet with 10 P's. P, lowercase p and hexadecimal turns into 70. So you see in the data field that 70, 70, 70, 70, 10 times is those 10 p's that I tagged the data with. And that 0a at the end, I believe, is just a carriage return. It's just the termination character of the string. Uh, but note that I specifically sent this packet to the destination I've highlighted of 192.168.1200. So that is the real IP address of the machine that I know that I am sending the data to. Then when I receive the anonymized data set back, I search for that data field that matches those 10 Ps in a carriage return, um, and I find it. So you'll see that in the anonymized packet that has the exact same data, which is my tag. So I can be reasonably certain that there's no application sending 10 p's and a carriage return so i can assume that that's the packet i sent um, but you'll notice the destination has changed now the destination says 10.1.13 and using this information we can then assume that when 192.168.1200 passes through the anonymization protocol it comes out as 10.1.1.13 so that means that must be its anonymized IP address. That IP address must be anonymized to 10.1.1.13. So again, this was uh, pretty surprising. We got pretty excited when we saw this because this was more than we expected to get. We expected there to have to be some guesswork or have to be some um, regression to actually like figure things together. We didn't expect it to be a purely a one 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 correlation, one to one correlation. Um, so because of this, uh, we then had to brainstorm what to do about it. Again, I said as part of this study, we're not just trying to break systems, we're trying to improve systems. So we had the students get together and come up with ideas for how this could be prevented, how we could improve this system to prevent someone from uh, re-anonymizing or re-identifying the anonymous data set. So we came up with two classes of 
recommendations for do it. The first one being technical recommendations. These are recommendations that uh, either require code or actually change the algorithm or do something in a way that has some technical solution to um, increase the privacy of this algorithm. So the first one, which is actually the strongest level of protection you can offer, is allowing researchers to request aggregate data. And when doing this, we actually don't need to provide the raw data at all. So for example, um, if researchers for a particular study or a particular research project only need to know general statistics, such as total packet sent, percentage of traffic that was HTTP, et cetera, um, they could just request that and do it could just provide that. A good concrete example of this would be, again, going back to the smart campus when you want to know how busy the commons is, you could potentially, instead of asking do it to give me the raw data that includes commons traffic, you could just say, tell me how many devices were connected to the commons at every hour in a 24 hour period and just getting that that those 24 sort of aggregate data sets or data points would remove the need for a researcher to actually have this raw data. There's plenty of research um, projects where this wouldn't be sufficient, where you would need the raw data, but there's also plenty that you probably wouldn't. So in general, the best way to preserve privacy is to not release the data set. So doing it this way um, would allow sort of researchers to still get benefit without releasing the data set to them. However, the major downfall of this is it would require do it to spend time and effort. They would need to create mechanisms for this. So they would have to write scripts. They would have to write queries to make sure that they could check this data. If a researcher came forward with a query they hadn't actually thought of before, they might have to spend some time to write it to implement how to do it. And that can be time consuming and costly. So it's completely understandable if that's not the path do it wants to go, at least not right now. Uh, but that is an option, especially in the future, uh, to essentially prevent having to release the data in the first place. Um, if we do end up releasing the actual data, uh, it could incorporate distortion into the timestamps, which could help prevent correlation. We did note that when the timestamps did not match up with the actual times we'd sent the packets, it was much harder to correlate them together. Um, we had a couple periods where we actually didn't think we were able to find anything or break anything or re-identify anything just because we couldn't find the packets due to some time mishaps. So incorporating distortion could be one way to do that. Um, one good way to do that would be differential privacy. I don't plan to go into that because that's actually a pretty complicated topic, but just know uh, that that's actually a method for mathematically proving a certain degree of privacy and adding noise into a data set in a way that you can actually prove that there is a level of privacy in the noise you injected to the data set. If you're interested in that, feel free to um, reach out to me, feel free to email me. Um, it's a pretty complicated topic, so I'm not going to devote time here to it, but differential privacy is really interesting and um, the students did do a little bit of looking into that and determined that that might be a good solution. A downfall of that is if you add noise to the timestamps, then things like timing analysis, uh, looking at um, the interpacket arrival time is a common metric to look at in traffic analysis. So those sort of things then go out the window. Researchers can't then look at that. Uh, so that has to be applied with care. Maybe there's two data sets, one that's differentially private, one that's not, and the researchers needs to determine which one they get um, with preference given to the differential privacy one. Um, in addition to that, uh, rotating the anonymization scheme regularly could also help increase user privacy. And the reason for this is I know I said in the beginning that you would expect these IP addresses to always be the same or else the data was useless, but that really only applies on the micro scale, on the seconds, minutes, hours, maybe days. But in the grand scheme of things, most researchers, unless you're doing a very long term project, probably don't particularly care if an IP address anonymization changes from year to year, maybe month to month. Um, so setting a time period in which the anonymization scheme rotates could make it so that way if someone does successfully perform this attack and gets a full list of de-anonymized, um, de re-identified IP addresses, if they requested data again in the future, 
they would have to do the whole attack again. They couldn't then apply that data set to the new um, anonymized data set. So that would uh, potentially reduce the benefits that a malicious actor could get out of the re-identification because that re-identification would only apply for their particular data set and wouldn't apply to future data sets. Um, so that is another technical way that uh, privacy could be preserved in this way. Beyond the technical recommendations, we also looked at policy-based recommendations, more administrative recommendations. Um, so these are things that do it could implement that don't actually touch the algorithm or the code itself, but are sort of procedures around how this data is released that could increase the privacy of that data, or at least reduce the risk of inferences being made. Um, it doesn't actually increase the privacy of the data itself. It's more of putting protections around the data to ensure that there is a lower chance that privacy can be leaked. Some examples of these recommendations include limiting the amount of data which could be requested or provided. Um, there's no reason to give a researcher six months of data if they are looking at a week time frame. So talking with the researchers, figuring out how much data they actually need instead of just giving them the whole bucket uh, could drastically um, reduce the amount of inferences they could make. It wouldn't prevent this attack from being successful, but if the attack was successful, it would limit the amount of inferences they could make using that information. So, for example, if you re-identified someone's IP to, as I said earlier, track them around campus, if you had six months of tracking versus one week, that would be much worse for privacy. So limiting that data to one week would be a much better outcome in that case. Additionally, uh, disallowing requesting data for specific dates and times is a major thing to ensure that this is limited. Uh, as I said earlier, we really only could do this attack because it was chosen plain text and we could request particular times. So if researchers are just given a time period and do not have control over which time period they are given, it can prevent attackers from being able to find packets that they tagged in the data set. Uh, we might allow researchers to give general time, say I want January's data, or I want a week of data, or I want every Tuesday for a month's data, but it would then be up to do it to say which January, which week, and then they would sort of select those parameters. Um, additionally, it would be a very good idea for um, any research projects involving this data to have a member of do it review the actual materials intended for public release, whether that's slides, whether that's presentations, whether that's a research paper, um, just to make sure that they're not releasing the raw data and just to make sure that any inferences they make from that data still preserves the privacy of the UMBC community. Furthermore, if you're uh, familiar with security, if you've done a lot of things in security, you probably know that when data gets out, it's nearly impossible to pull it back in. A lot of times if a system gets compromised, you just have to assume it's bad until you do a factory reset. Um, there's the joke that the only way to really ensure a system is completely clean is to throw it into the sun. Um, so it's sort of the same for privacy. So when um, data gets out that you don't intend to get out that has private information in it, you really can't take it back. So restricting the storage of the data to only UMBC owned IT assets, UMBC owned cloud services, the UMBC drive, UMBC email uh, would help protect it to a prevent accidental release or inadvertent release out to the public to compromise privacy. Uh, this can be extended. Uh, we thought that it would be helpful to have some exemptions for researchers to use their personal computer, especially in the modern work from home world. Uh, it's sort of unreasonable to expect all computations to be formed strictly on UMBC property, um, but that would come with record keeping of needing to know exactly who had the data, exactly what computers did, and some certification, even if it's a self-certification, that you have deleted the data off the, your computer once that process is done. Um, finally, 
it's important to maintain an audit trail so that way if anything does happen, it can sort of be pieced together how it happened to prevent it from happening again. So how can, maintaining strict access records where we record the names, the roles, the contact information of everyone who had access to that data and where they put it um, is important to make sure if something does happen, we can follow the trail to ensure it doesn't happen again. So as far as these policy recommendations, um, as I said, they don't affect the actual privacy of the data set. So one beneficial thing that these policy recommendations do is they actually preserve the utility of the data set. Because again, we're not altering the privacy versus utility trade-off. We're actually keeping that the same and putting protections around the data to prevent privacy leakage as opposed to actually increasing the privacy of the data. Another benefit I don't have on the slide of the private policy recommendations is a lot of times they can be implemented quicker. Uh, the technical ones require some sort of work and effort to maybe rewrite some parts of the code or add scripts that can do aggregate data, whereas these policy recommendations can realistically be started immediately. Um, so they don't take as much effort to implement, which is very nice. So that was a list of sort of what we recommended to do it to continue to allow them to have this service which is very beneficial uh, with while also ensuring that people's privacy remains protected and that umbc members um, don't feel like do it as giving out their private information so uh, really the key takeaways um, from this particular talk and study i want to look at is that first of all protecting privacy is hard it seems kind of tautological to say, it seems obvious, um, but it really can't be overstated that protecting privacy is hard. Um, and it's very different from security. So security is also hard. I'm not saying security is easy, but it's very different. In cybersecurity, typically it's a binary, either the, it's breached or it's not. There's obviously exceptions. There's plenty of ways that cannot be true. And I know it can be very hard to detect breaches, but a lot of times when there is evidence of a breach, you can conclusively say, this is a breach that may have these consequences. It's a little harder to do that in privacy because you're intentionally releasing these data sets. In security, we're kind of trying to prevent these things from being released by bad actors, where in privacy, we are doing the releasing ourselves and we're trying to protect the data that's present in it. So it's a hard thing to do to protect against inferences and it's very different from security so it requires different methods and different ways of thinking about it um and as i said earlier you can't just remove the sensitive data because that could make the data useless to anyone who actually wants to use it um sort of a corollary to that is anonymization is a really great tool to, for helping us uh preserve privacy increase the privacy of a data set but it does have weaknesses. You can't just slap anonymization onto a data set and call it good. Just ship it out, release it, and say that you've done what you've your due diligence, say that you've done all you can. You really need to make sure that the anonymization strategy you you apply is going to fully protect the data. Um, that said, I think that Doit did a good job with what they did. I don't want this to anyone to walk away from this thinking that Doit did it badly. Um, so there, the methods they use actually do prevent a lot of easy inferences from being made. Um, we had to use a chosen plain text attack, which does require insider access to do. First of all, you need to be a member of the UMBC research community who has access to the data in the first place. You can't have a random person come off the street and gain access to this data. Um, second of all, it does require pre-planning. If you get data before you have actually sent out any packets, or if you get data from a time frame where you didn't send packets, then it can't be re-identified in this way. So um, the combination of the insider access requirements and the pre-planning requirements actually make it pretty difficult to pull this off reliably in a way that could be universally applied. So I don't want anyone to think that we're saying do it did everything horribly and they applied a technique that didn't work. Their technique definitely works. We were just able to find a case in which we their technique broke down and provide some recommendations for how to improve their technique to protect against it. I also, honestly, one takeaway I want to make sure everyone comes off with is honestly a massive thank you to do it for their willingness to make this data available. A lot of universities would just say no. 
Um, it is much easier to protect the privacy by not releasing this data. That is the best way to protect the privacy is to not release it. Um, obviously, that gives us no utility. That's full privacy, no utility, as we discussed. But there's a lot of for universities that would just say, we're not taking the risk. We're not going to give you this. And so having the ability to actually request these real world data sets for our research projects is a massive, massive benefit. It's a huge boon to the research community. Um, because if you've ever worked with the synthetic data set before, maybe one generated by models, uh, you'll know that it doesn't fully apply to the real world. You can make a lot of good assumptions and do a lot of great things with it, but nine times out of 10, you need that real world data set to make a very fault tolerant model or very good conclusions. So the ability to essentially request it and have it provided by IT is massive. And I definitely wanna thank them for doing that. Um, but yeah, so that is sort of the study that we performed. I want to also highlight if it seems like this uh, wasn't too many results, like, okay, we we did a quick attack and we identified th some things. This actually occurred over the period of four days. So this is a massive, um, massive like result for only four days of work. I'm very impressed by all of the students who participated. I'm very impressed by the work that all of them did. I want to make sure I say who it was. I don't want anyone to think that I'm coming here saying this was all my work and all my idea. Um, all of these people helped drastically with um, different parts of it. Some of them did the attack. Some of them looked at the code. Some of them did the policies. But we had a lot of great participants who uh, really made this possible. And been, to be able to fully re-identify an anonymized data set in four days' time is very impressive. So I really want to applaud them for what they've done. I also want to give special thanks to um, the organizers, do it, um, anyone else who is helping uh, to make this possible. Because again, this is my first time being the student lead, so I could not have done this without some help. Um, but yeah, so this was overall, I think, very successful. Um, it taught the students a lot about privacy and how it's done. And I think we'll have some very good recommendations. We can go to do it and help them to continue to release this data while preserving privacy in the future. So at that point, that's the end of everything I have to say. Does anyone have any questions? I'm curious, did you also examine a cipher text only attack? And if so, what did you find? So we didn't really spend too much time in ciphertext only um, just because that's sort of where anonymization thrives in this way. So if we didn't use, if we use ciphertext only, uh, when you're breaking anonymization, there's actually examples of people doing this with um, like Netflix data that was released publicly. Uh, you need to be able to have background knowledge and make inferences. So in the Netflix data set, they were able to use IMDB to sort of correlate ratings of users to the IMDB database um, and sort of look at that and find users that had the same um, ratings from the same location. So you sort of need that background knowledge with anonymization. Um, there are exceptions, like obviously if you have someone's age, you have their street address, even though you don't have your name, you can probably figure out who it is. Um, in network header data, we really did not expect that to be the case. If we didn't know who the IP address was, just looking at packet lengths and protocols with some machine learning models and given a few weeks, we could probably come up with something, but it was too much for us to just visually analyze. By the way, that's a fantastic follow up for the, for the study. Uh, if we if we were to give you some metadata, right? If we were to give you maybe um, this is the location of the access point uh, where the device was connected to, or, or something like that, right? Like, could you break the anonymization scheme when you're using just the cipher text? Yeah, and that would be something that honestly, um, I don't know the avenues to continue this, but if anyone's listening is interested in continuing this, like definitely reach out. I'm sure there are ways to do that, and. In the larger time frame with like machine learning models and things like that, I'm sure there's a lot we can glean from just ciphertext, especially like locations, like Dr. Yus is saying, as far as how people move around campus. And that would be excellent to look at. I'm sure that could be really interesting to do if people are interested in that. In the chat, there's a question from Ram 
Rustagi, will tagging technique work if these were IPv6 primarily because it has lesser number of fields which can be used for tagging? So that's a very good question. Um, so there's really two um, hurdles with IPv6. The first one being that it tends to be used less. So a lot of times there might be misconfigurations in the routers and firewalls, which can both work for you and against you. It can work for you because it might let packets through that couldn't be let through otherwise, which would actually make it a little easier. But it could also work against you because it could drop things with even the very slightest amount of modification onto them. And as you stated, the sort of attack surface is lesser. There's less fields you could modify. Um, I'm not familiar enough with IPv6 to sort of give you a conclusive answer of how you could do this with IPv6. My gut feeling is that as long as you can modify headers in a way that it makes it through the routing, you could repeat this attack with IPv6. Uh, but I would expect it would feel different. I don't know if that different is easier or harder, but it would feel different to do it IPv6 just because of router configurations and limited fields. Um, could you also please comment on the insider attack from this year? Oh, yes, of course. So one interesting thing that um, is incorporated into the SFS studies is that there is a insider threat that is always present. And it's always um, a member of the study, not necessarily a student. It could be someone who is helping uh, to organize, someone who is helping to sort of provide access to things. And so there's always some sort of threat that the study members need to pay attention to and watch out for. And this year, we actually had a member of Do It themselves was uh, the insider threat. It was actually the person who was provisioning our servers for us. So we did this in a sort of sandbox. They gave us a server to hold all the data in. Again, recommendation we had is to keep the data on UMBC IT. So they did that. They gave us a server they controlled that we ran all of our experiments on. Um, so, uh, halfway through the particular um, study, they swapped out the machines on us. So they didn't change the keys because, again, if you've done security, the, that's probably the first thing you'd think of was um, actually getting a notification saying the keys have changed. Um, they were very careful to preserve all of that information. So uh, if you were using an SSH client that stored the keys, as most of them do, I think all of them do, uh, you were not getting the notification that, hey, the host address changed or the host identification has changed. Um, they did leave a few breadcrumbs. So first of all, the actual process of um, swapping the servers happened during the study hours, but at lunchtime. So it was actually really sneaky because anyone who was logged into the server before lunch then came went out to lunch and then came back would have gotten kicked off the server. Um, but that might have just been assumed to be a timeout or something. So no one actually caught that. We hypothesized that if we did have to do this remotely, um, just because that's the format that we use a lot of times now. But if we were in person, we may have actually caught this easier because there might have been more people getting kicked off and more people would have noticed. And if five people in the room all got kicked off at the same time, that may have triggered some particular um, red flags. But as we were all remote, none of us thought anything of it when we got randomly kicked off at lunchtime. A lot of us assumed it was a timeout. Another thing they did is they actually changed the banner at the top when you logged in from the um, do it uh, phone number to their personal phone number to see if anyone would call it uh, to notice that it changed. Uh, they left a couple misspellings in the banner just to sort of do it, but no one noticed that because everyone was so focused on the actual data itself. The biggest um, breadcrumb that they left was they did change out all the keys on the very last day of the study. So if you would have logged into the machine on the last day of the study, you would have gotten that notification that the host identification changed, which is a big red flag that something went wrong. But I think only one student logged in because by the last day of the study, we had all of our results and we were preparing the recommendations and the presentation. I think only one person logged in during that, and I cannot fault them for just clicking through the banner because we were so focused in presentation mode and like getting everything together that I can't remotely 
judge them for just clicking through that banner. Uh, but it was a good lesson to remain astute. And if you see banners like that, definitely take them seriously and don't assume just because you're on a trusted computer that everything's okay. Hello, uh, I have one more question. Yep. All right. So uh, I'm confused as to how like the destination IP addresses are considered uh, sensitive information that could like uh, re that uh, we need to like uh, to anonymize for privacy. So that's a good question. So this is again something that can make privacy difficult and that makes it a little different from cybersecurity. So. One thing that's big in privacy is you may not be able to get data with one attribute, but you may be able to make inferences with more. So IP address, first of all, um, is sort of what we would call a quasi identifier. Um, it does allow us to identify something, but it is not a perfect identification. Um, IP addresses can change, especially um, if you're using DHCP, those things can hop around. Uh, it's unlikely that most of the campus IPs do that. Most of them are probably static, but there, I'm sure there are some DHCPs hopping around. Um, so you can't 100% say what a destination is just by its IP address, but um, you can use other information from that IP address. So um, latency is a big one. There's a lot of uh, study is done on tracking latency through a network to see how many hops it goes through. I believe that's actually how um, Tor traffic um, can be an onion routed traffic can sort of be traced is by looking at the latency of packets as they um, hop through things. So sort of combining that IP address with the latency, maybe the protocol, maybe if uh, you notice that the port is an HTTP port, uh, it presumably has a web server running, and you can sort of use all of that information together to figure out what server it is. And then when you know what server it is, you might then know what attack vectors open up on that particular server. Um, so that's sort of like a security aspect. And then from a privacy aspect, um, again, location is a big one. So if you have someone's IP address, um, you may not be able to know exactly what it is, who they are. But if you combine that with this IP address connected to ITE floor three, and then ITE floor two, and then back to floor three, and then the commons, you can assume that, okay, maybe it's a professor who has an office on the third floor, went down to the second floor to teach a class, returned to their office, then went to get lunch. And you can sort of make that inference just from IP addresses. Um, so that's sort of what we're looking for from a privacy standpoint is even though the attribute itself isn't necessarily sensitive, a lot of them are public and just can be looked up, the correlation and relationship between multiple entries then starts to tell a picture that we can use to infer information. Okay. Uh, so would like this kind of like correlation require knowing the source IP address or, or do you not need it? it? It depends on what you're doing. So in the location example I used, you'd probably want to know um, the source because you'd probably want to see the source and who it was connecting to. Um, there might be other attacks uh, that use protocols or use packet lengths. Maybe there's an application um, that's running on someone's phone, just throwing it out. Like maybe TikTok always sends a packet of a particular length and it does it every 30 seconds. And if you saw in the data set a packet on that port of that particular length every 30 seconds, you would know that whatever that IP address was, was accessing TikTok, and you wouldn't need to use the other part of that IP, the like destination. You would just need to know the one. Um, so that's an example of how you could use something, um, some other information to infer that someone is using TikTok. So um, it depends on what you're trying to find. This is what Dr. Yu said as far as that's an excellent question for continuing this research is can with machine learning models, what can we find? Um, without using two IP addresses? What can we find with just one IP address? All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there's another question in the chat. If DOIT were to look at TCP UDP traffic and then use different anonymized IP addresses for different port numbers sessions, would that improve matters? That's a good question. Um, 
on the surface, I would say yes. Um, so that again is the privacy versus utility. I do from just off the top of my head, I assume that would increase privacy because essentially each session would have an anonymized IP address that you could not link. And if they did it across sessions, you realistically could not use this attack because you would create one session to send the packet. And by the time you got the data, more sessions have been created and the IP address already changed. Um, the one thing that would reduce utility wise is you would then lose the information about computers that may be running multiple services. Maybe it's running an HTTP server and an HTTPS server and an SSH server. And if a researcher was interested in how those interacted with each other, you wouldn't get that information. Um, but depending on the research goal, that could be a very good idea for how to drastically improve the privacy while still maintaining what the researchers need to do. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, it's more of a debate, so I'm just going to throw it here. We don't, I don't expect you, uh, Christian, to answer completely because it's also a hard question. So um, how do we reconcile the aspect of um, you're sharing data to do research, right? And we are seeing that in conferences, they are pushing uh, a little bit more every day on you have to release your data set, you have to release your artifacts because you have to have reproducibility, right? So with these recommendations that you're uh, doing, right? Like, so um, would you feel comfortable about like the UMBC researchers sharing the data with the um, research community, the data that they use for their analysis? Or do we need more mechanisms in place? Um, is this maybe an avenue for one of uh, Alan's cryptographic sophisticated techniques to maybe um, do some reproducibility while not releasing the data set? Well, so, how do we do this? Good question. Um, on the surface, I would say that I would not have issues releasing the data set. Um, and the reason is because the attack we performed requires pre planning. So if you have not already started the attack before getting the data set, then you would not be able to perform this attack. So for this particular attack, I would have no issues releasing the anonymized data set because um, I don't think that could be positively correlated. That said, that's a good opportunity for future research because again, like we just looked at a chosen plain text attack. If you had a cipher text only attack that you determined ended up working um, based on like maybe models or something or machine learning, uh, that would then open up that question again as to what would the risk of sharing that data be? There's a, another online question um, about uh, the privacy aspects of cookie trackers. I see. Yep. Yeah. So, a uh, question is: Is the role of cookie trackers more uh, related to privacy, anonymization, or security? Um, that's an interesting question. So. Obviously, cookies are useful or we wouldn't use them a lot. Um, it can be very beneficial to have them. I'm I'm not of the belief that every cookie is necessarily bad, um, but it definitely is a privacy concern. Um, I wouldn't call it security. Um, there is a tax you can do with cookies, especially if you use cookies to like store session information. Um, so there is security implications to cookies, but in my understanding, that's lesser than the privacy. That happens much, much less frequently than the privacy concerns. I wouldn't also call it anonymization uh, just because they do typically, I think, use session IDs and pseudonyms for those cookies. But I think that's more for a data storage potential um, than like an anonymization reason. It, sure, anonymization goes into it, but I also think that's more computers process numbers easier than text. Um, but as far as the privacy aspects, um, I would definitely say that's where I would put like cookie trackers is tracking someone through multiple websites doesn't really help you break into their computer, but it does show you maybe how old they are, maybe what their sexual orientation is, maybe what their religion is. And those are things that people might want to keep private. Um, Cause if cookie tracker tracks you to your church's home website, then it's reasonable to assume you go to that church. Um, so that is both a location privacy consideration and that is a religion privacy consideration. So those are 
things you may not want public. So I would consider that a privacy issue. And finally, would you like to share with us what your thoughts on what your dissertation is going to involve? That's a good question. I'm still trying to nail that down a little bit, um, but um, in particular, so my focus is data privacy and IoT. And so my dissertation is going to primarily be focused on how do we ask questions of devices, specifically IoT devices, in a way that preserves privacy. And an example I can give of this is let's take universities. Let's say we have University of Maryland, um, Baltimore County, so UMBC. We have UMD, so just uh, College Park. Maybe they want to share some information. So uh, it might be the case that UMBC wants to know how many people use a classroom on average. And there's a bunch of ways you can do that. You can use cameras, but that all uh, opens up a big can of worms as to do you want a camera in your classroom just to count how many students are in there. Um, there was another university that put sensors under each desk to actually check to see if it was occupied, but then that answered or opened up questions as are universities using that to attendance track and to essentially um, be judgmental, be um, sort of prejudiced against students who are skipping class frequently. Uh, and then there's other considerations like there's you can actually use a carbon dioxide sensor to measure how many people are in the room if you know the dimensions of the room uh, just based on how much carbon dioxide is in the air. So you can use all those different things. And then when we ask a question of a database, when we ask some sort of question and we might say, I want to know the average um, occupancy of a classroom, how do we do that? using all of those sensors I mentioned in a way that gives us an accurate enough answer that we can reasonably say for sure that the answer is correct, but while also preserving the privacy of the people who frequent that space. And then that becomes even bigger when we then talk about you adding UMD into it. Now, how can UMBC share the occupancy data with UMD without risking UMBC student privacy um, to coordinate this sort of collaboration. So it's uh, my thesis will be focused and my dissertation will be focused a lot on how do we unlock the content of or the con like the uh, ability to ask complex questions to uh, systems of large IoT devices that have a lot of them while still preserving the privacy of the people who frequent those spaces. Well, thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Awesome. Thank you for having me. This thank concludes you, our session. Take care, everyone.